Welcome to this video where we talk about feature hashing and we motivate it uh, by looking at these previous two examples that we saw for representing text as vectors, uh, where we saw all these sparse vector representations so using bag of words and TF-IDF representations. So here we introduce feature hashing uh, as a technique as well that you can use when representing text uh, as vectors. So again, right, the, the problem that we motivated it all through was, for instance, constructing a spam filter where you have these text and you want to know whether this text is a uh, real email or a spam email. So you want to do basically machine learning or classification on text data. Now, in the bag of words video, uh, we basically saw the bag of words representation of a text document. Uh, we assume that all the words in the text come from the English dictionary, for instance. And then we take our text document and represent it as a vector, uh, a vector that has one entry per coordinate in the dictionary. And uh, each of those entries just store a count of how many times does this word occur in this document, right? So in this example up here again, I uh, will see that potency occurs once, Viagra occurs twice, cow occurs zero times, right? So we have a, there's a word in the vector or a coordinate in the vector for every possible word in the dictionary. Okay, so this is the bag of words representation that we already saw, right? So just storing counters of the number of occurrences of words. Then we saw the TF-IDF representation. Uh, the goal of the TF-IDF uh, representation was to say, well, words that occur in many documents, uh, basically all documents, they should not really count that much uh, in these frequency vectors or the vectors that we're constructing, like the doom bag of words. For instance, like the word like and or the occurs in almost all documents. So having a large count for all these words in all of our bag of words representation seems uh, a bit wasteful and also it could actually uh, mess up the, the learning algorithms if we have these coordinates that are the same and large for all our feature vectors. So the TFF IDF representation, instead of storing uh, for every entry in the vector, we store the number of occurrences. Instead, we store this product here, the TF term and the IDF term. Well, the TF term is basically we store the number of occurrences of a word in the document divided by the total length of the document. So it's kind of like how, how large a fraction of the words in this document are equal to this word. But then we also weigh them by this inverse document frequency where we have a training data set of documents and then we count how many of the documents contain this word and then we multiply with a factor log of n over this number. Right? This is the way of saying that if something occurs in every document then the weight basically becomes zero and if it occurs in only a single document it's a rare word and it gets a big weight of the log n. Right? So this is what we saw in the previous two videos. <clears throat> the issues with these two representations are that they give very very long uh, vectors, in particular, the naive representation we just saw, the vectors would be proportional to the length of the English dictionary. Right, so they just have these sparse vectors. We saw then to deal with this, we saw these sparse vector representations where we could use a list, for instance, to store them, where in the list you just store uh, pairs. The first element in the list is uh, the index into the vector that's non zero, and then the count is the second element. So position two is one, position 34,011 is one, and so forth. And we store this list in sorted order of uh, the first coordinate here. And we also saw dictionaries. Uh, which would, you could use where you just simply store, for instance, if it's two grams you're counting, like uh, occurrences of two consecutive words, you just take every pair of two consecutive words in the text and store it in the dictionary where you map the, the word of the two gram to the count. Okay, so these were different representations we saw. And we saw that these representations, we argued that these could actually be used uh, together with support vector machines, for instance, because all that support vector machines requires is that we can compute this kernel which is supposed to be the inner product between two feature vectors. And then we can use these sparse vector representations to quickly compute the inner products. And this is all that we need to feed into support vector machines. Okay, so, so this means that we can still use support vector machines with these sparse vector representations and everything is great. We can actually run this learning algorithm right? because the, and the inner products are fast to compute even. Uh, you can do it with the, with the list. You can do it in proportional to the, to the sum of the length of the two documents that you're comparing, right? Now, on the other hand, we saw neural nets. <clears throat> and for neural nets, it does not really seem that having these sparse inputs help, right? There's no way of feeding in a list or a dictionary into a neural net. And somehow, even though you could say maybe even the first layer here, you know, maybe only a few of these neurons are non-zero, but if it's a fully connected neural net, then already in the next layer, you know, everything might be non-zero, at least if the next layer is proportional in size to the first one. So, so there's something with these sparse representations. They might not be that great. Um, for neural nets, and, and I guess you need actually to have one of these neurons uh, for every possible word in the dictionary. Right? So, so this is not so great. 
and the representation breaks down here. And this is what we'll try to address in, in this video here. We'll try to talk about one way of dealing with it uh, known as using uh, feature hashing. So that's the thing we'll look at. So, okay, so if we look at bag of words, we can actually start by doing a little bit to reduce the number of features. And, and the thing we can do here is we can do, well, what if we just, you know, the dictionary has 171,000 words. Many of the words in the English dictionary are not that common. So what you could start by doing is scan all the training documents that you have available, and then you collect all the words or all the n-grams that you see, and then you just give them consecutive numbers, right? Whenever you find a new word, you just, you know, say, um, this is number i plus one, and then i plus two, i plus three. So just every time you see a new word or a new n-gram, uh, you just put in a dictionary or a hash map where you store a mapping from all the words, n-grams to numbers. In particular, if you're looking at the n-grams, I think the way we represented it in the bag of words video was to say, well, then the number of coordinates is the, the size of the English dictionary squared if it's the two grams. And this is already billions in, this, uh, in the order of billions. So of course, right, you'll never have a billions long vector. You can start by reducing it by simply you know, scanning through all the training documents and then just kind of, in some sense, you're, you're filtering out all the words or n-grams that never occur. So just give them numbers, all the ones that you see, and then you only have an entry in your feature vector for every word that was seen in the training data or every n-gram that was seen in the training data set. <clears throat> right. It does reduce the number of features somewhat in particular for n-grams. So that's that's great. Uh, the issue is that, you know, it still is, especially if you use n-grams and, you know, maybe you'll actually collect quite a few different n-grams in particular, say that your training data set is maybe millions of documents then maybe your feature vector will actually be in the order of millions long, right? So, so it's still, it's better than billions that we got from just saying the dictionary, every pair of words in the dictionary, that was a two gram. It's still better than that, but uh, it, it can still be very, very large. So it's not so great in particular also for feeding into a neural net. It's, it's still not that good a choice. So, so what else could we try and do? So feature hashing now is a way of taking such very sparse feature vectors and quickly mapping them to <clears throat> shorter vectors. Right. So every once you think of it as every entry of the feature of this uh, feature vector corresponds to a word on n-gram, it could either be in bag of words representation, it could also be in TF-IDF representation. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to map such a feature vector to a much shorter vector. That's what feature hashing does. So one can think of it as a type of dimensionality reduction, like we saw uh, in some of the previous videos with random projections, PCA, and so forth. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to map from D features, let's say that the, the original feature vector is the total number of coordinates is D, and we're going to map it to K with K being much smaller than D. And the special thing about feature hashing compared to the ones that we've seen earlier on is that it's, it's very, very fast to compute, uh, in particular for sparse vectors, if you have sparse vectors to, to embed. So let me try to see or to explain how you do feature hashing. <clears throat> so let's say the top vector here, u, is the vector that we want to uh, compress or to dimensionality reduce. So it has d features and it's very sparse. And what we're going to output is a vector f of u, so the feature hashed version of u, and it has only k, non, uh, k coordinates. And the approach is we start by initializing this to zero, and then we'll do the following. So what we'll do is we'll pick a so-called hash function, and I'll get more into what a hash function is, but it's basically a function that maps the original D features, maps each of them to one of the K features down here. So it maps features in U to, to new features, uh, or features in the new vector F of U. Uh, so here the notation uh, D just means zero to D minus one. Uh, for this video here, we'll just assume these vectors are zero indexed. Okay, so that's more consistent with how you usually do hash functions. You could also do it one index, but uh, for this video, we'll do zero index vectors. Okay, so we have this hash function. You have another hash function as well called G. And what G does is it maps also every feature in the original input domain. If I tell you a feature number, it maps it to a random sign minus 101. Okay, so we have these two hash functions, H and G. So they're just functions that map uh, original uh, feature the index of a feature to a position in a shorter vector and also to a sign. And what is the rule then? Now let me try to pass what it says here. So let's look at the vector u in position t. T thing of t is corresponding to a term. So it's the tth entry of u. T lies between zero and d minus one. 
then let's say that you have a C here, that this entry is storing a C. Then what you do is you go into the F of U vector, right? The in this shorter vector here, and you you apply now the hash function, the H function here to T. So that maps, that gives a an index uh, from zero to K minus one. So it gives an index into this vector. You take that coordinate and then you add C to it. So the count that you have in the original vector, but you multiply this C by the sign that you get by taking the G function and applying to T. Okay, so uh, the basic idea, so let's try and, and dive a little bit more into the details here. Okay, so the basic idea is that you have this uh, functions that map from the large domain, the input domain, to the small domain K. And what you'd like uh, to hold for this hash function is that somehow it should distribute the items or the coordinates in the original space kind of evenly on these K coordinates in the smaller uh, space, so the, the shorter feature vectors. A bit more formally, uh, if you actually want to implement this, you will choose typically these hash functions using some kind of randomness. So here's just an example of a very popular um, hash function that one could use. And so, so this one, you just say, okay, pick a prime number P, that's at least the number of features that you have originally. Okay, then you choose first a number A, uniformly at random between one and P minus one, you choose a number B uniformly at random between zero and P minus one. And then you could use the hash function uh, that maps A comma B to AX plus B modulo P modulo K. Right, so this is one choice of hash function. So what is it? It's basically saying you, you pick two random numbers. You When you want to compute where a word uh, maps to or an entry in the original vector, say X is an index into the original full vector, you take that X, you multiply it with A, you add the B, this gives you some number, then you do modulo this prime, and then you do modulo K. So the last modulo here uh, maps the number to a number between zero and K minus one. This is just one example of such a hash function. And this hash function has a very nice property that one can prove if one wants to. And what you can prove is that, well, if I choose this A and B randomly, like I've, it's set up here uniformly in these ways, then if I look at two different positions in my original vector x and y the probability that they hash to the same so now right now I choose my a and b the probability they end up in the same location in this shorter vector is at most one divided by k and remember that k positions in this short vector right so so it's kind of like a, you throw them in randomly into the short vector and only with probability one over k they will collide okay so this is a uh, property of this hash function here um <clears throat> So, so and many hash functions have this property that you, you just use a little bit of randomness, a small random seed, it's called. Um, for instance, just choosing this A and B and using this hash function. Yeah. So they use a little bit of randomness to, to help you distribute these keys. And, and the, the point is, the important thing here is that once you have chosen the function, once you've chosen A and B, A and B remains fixed for the rest of the time that you work with your data. Right? So they don't change anymore from this point on. Uh, the hash function is in some sense a deterministic function, right? It always, if I feed in the same X, it's always going to give the same output. Okay, so it's only in the beginning that I choose this A and B before I do any processing of my data. Okay, so what we're going to use here is that there are simple hash functions uh, with a small chance of collision. Uh, so that's what you just saw here. If I pick this A and B in the previous example, the probability of collision, if I have two different keys, is only one over K, where K is the output size. So that's what you just saw an example of. And also for the function G, what we want from this function G is just that, well, this is the function that is supposed to give us a random sign for every coordinate that, that is in the original uh, feature vector. And the property that this function need is that uh, if I look at the evaluation of this hash function G of X and G and Y for two different X's and Y's, then these two values are independent and uniform random. Right. And there are also very efficient ways to implement this, but we'll not talk too much more about it in, in this video. It's really a huge literature on research literature on how to construct such hash functions. There are many very practical hash functions that perform very well. So maybe, you know, if you can find a randomized algorithms course to follow, you can learn more about this type of uh, hash functions. Okay. So <clears throat> let's try to see what we do here. So let's run, go back to our example. We have this vector U, it has D coordinates. 
And now I want to construct this feature hashed version of u called f of u here has k coordinates. And we have this hash function h that maps original coordinates to coordinates here. We have the hash function g that maps original coordinates to a sign. The rule says again, if I have an entry up here, the teeth entry in the top vector, if this is equal to c, then I should go to my feature hashed vector. I apply the h hash function on the term t, on the index t, to get a new index into this vector. And I update that index by adding c, but multiply it with the random sign. So let's have a look here. So this is position one. Remember, these are zero indexed vectors. So this is position one. And let's say this hash function h, you, you insert one into the hash function and it outputs four. So this tells us to go to position four in f. And the g function, let's say that this outputs a one. So this means the h function tells us to look in entry four. Remember, again, it's zero index, zero, one, two, three, four. So we should go to this entry. And then we should take the count C, this is a one up here, multiply it with the one down here and add it to the entry. So now let's, this says one. And we have to do this for all the entries in the U vector. Now the observation is that the entries with zeros, they don't matter, so we can skip those, right? Because they only contribute zero. So the next one we have here, uh, this is in position seven of the U vector, maybe seven hashes to zero, to so the first position in F of U. And maybe the sign here is minus one, the g function applied to seven, which means that we go to this uh, very first entry of index zero, that's what the h hash function tells us to, we take the minus one and multiply it with the one. So now this is our new feature vector. Uh, the, the, so, and we have to scan through all of the coordinates of the top vector. So now we, this is position nine. Um, this could be that the hash of nine is also zero, so it maps to the same position. And maybe in this case, the g function applied to nine uh, is the sign one, which means now we have to add one to the first entry here. So we have to add one here. And you'll see in this case, these two actually canceled out. So now this new entry of the vector is actually back to zero. We'll go up this is the 10th entry, maybe it hashes to the index two, so zero, one, two. So it goes to this entry and maybe the g function is a minus one. So we'll put a minus two in this position. We keep going. Maybe the 13th position is has to position four with the sign of one. So it goes to this position. You take one times one and add it to it. So now this is two. Finally, maybe 17 is hash to position five with the sign of one. And so we add it here. And now this then is the new representation, the feature hashed version of our original feature vector U called F of U. So this is the vector that we use instead of the original one. <clears throat> right. Now, the point is, if I have another vector here, V, right, so this is another vector with just, a, in this case, it just has a single one. The important point is that, uh, and this is really important for, otherwise it doesn't work at all, is that you use the same hash function on all the documents or vectors that you want to hash. So, which means when I look at this, this is the 10th entry in both of them. Uh, I'm always gonna use the compute H of 10 and G of 10, which means, these are gonna always, if two positions are the same in V and U, they're always gonna hash to the same entry in F of U and F of V. So they're both gonna map here. And they're also both gonna use the same sign when this is crucially important, which means that this one is gonna be a minus one here and this two went, became a minus two in here. <clears throat> so it's very important that things that before had the same coordinate, they're gonna use the same hash function. So they're always gonna hash to the same place and always gonna get the same sign. So why is this useful, right? If I look at the inner product of the original vectors, u and v, before I feature hash them, then the jth coordinate, right, the contribution to the inner product is just the uj times vj, right? That's just by definition of the inner product. Two times one is what we would contribute to the inner product. Now, the observation is that when I'm using this hash function h, the same one on u and v, right? Because the same hash function is the same random choice, and I reuse the same hash function, then it, H is applied to J in both cases. So it's always going to hash to the same position like we saw in this example here. So they're always going to end in the same bucket or coordinate of, of F of U and F of V, which means that when you compute the inner product of F of U and F of V, they're going to multiply those two positions. And you know since they both end there, you know, when you get to the position where they both hash, 
you're going to get the uj coordinate and this has been multiplied with gj when it went into the first uh, vector and in the second vector you would have the vj value that would have been multiplied with the gj and as you can see here since they use the same sign also as you can see in this example like minus two and minus one when you multiply all of it the signs cancel out so they actually just contribute the they get the original contribution that you had before Okay, so which means that anything that contributed to the original inner product between U and V, they still contribute to the inner product by the same amount after computing F of U and F of V. Right, so it means to so indicate that you know uh, inner products tend to be similar to what they were before. So this is a property we like. Now, if I have two coordinates I and J uh, that are different, right? For instance, say the second coordinate, the coordinate here in U and this coordinate down here in V, then in the original inner product, they don't contribute anything to the inner product, right? They're not aligned. So they don't contribute to the inner product. They contribute zero. Okay, but actually what happens here, right? This hash function H just maps things randomly into positions down here. And so there'll be some of these coordinates that end up in the same bucket or coordinate in, in F of U and F of V. And this is unavoidable simply because there are fewer coordinates here than there are in the beginning, right? So some coordinates have to end up in the same bucket. So with some small probability, they do end up in the same bucket. When they do, the contribution to the inner product becomes, well, UI, uh, because that's what the value U had in position I, VJ, right, which is the position J had in position V. So this UI VJ product here somehow now contributes to the inner product, even though before it, it didn't, before you hashed them. Uh, when you just looked at U and V. Now, but the point is that UI is multiplied with the random sign GI and uh, VJ is multiplied with the random sign GJ. And now what we said is that these random signs, we, we said briefly that this G hash function, what we want from it is that if I look at the hash value of two different indices, I and J, then these hash values are independent and uniform random signs. So the product of two independent uniform random signs is itself uniform random between minus one and one, which means that their expectation, the expectation of this whole inner product is actually zero. And so, so this is nice. So, you know, uh, before we hash the vectors, we know that two different coordinates contribute zero to the inner product. After hashing, at least the expected contribution to the inner product is zero, no, though not the actual contribution, but in expectation, it's zero. Okay, so this is something that we like, and actually it's a simple exercise to use this observation to prove that the expectation of the inner product between the two feature has vectors down here is equal to uh, the original inner product between the two vectors, right? So this is a nice property of feature hashing, right? That inner products are preserved at least in expectation. And if, if you remember many of the linear models we saw, uh, they often, uh, you know, use the inner products between vectors um, too in their analysis and performance. For instance, support vector machines is all about inner products. Okay. So let me just remind you, we saw this johnson lindstrass transform also at some point, right, where um, what we did was we could take these vectors x1 to xd, we could multiply them with a matrix A full of normal distributed random variables, mean zero and variance one. We can apply the scaling of one over root k, and we saw this in the random projection video. And also in that video, we talked about, at least towards the end of it, that this johnson instras transform, you could also replace all the normal distributed random variables by uniform random signs. So if you look at feature hashing, it's almost the same, actually, if you think about it. One can think of feature hashing as being a random matrix that we use to embed a vector. And in this random matrix, Every column is zero everywhere except in one uniform random entry. And that one entry is uniform random between minus one and one. And why is that, right? So one can think of it as, well, if I look at the jth column here, now the position of the non-zero would be the same as the hash value of J. Because then if I multiply A with a feature vector X, then the jth coordinate is going to contribute XJ times this column. And that means that it's going to be added to the entry corresponding to the hash value of J in this output, the K rows here in the output. So, so this is basically, and, and, and this the value that you have here, the sign of this non-zero, it's a, either one or minus one, right? that sign will be G of J. 
Right? So, so actually, feature hashing corresponds exactly to the John Lindstrass transform, but where you pick a different matrix. You pick a matrix that has a single non-zero per column. That uh, non-zero is in a uniform random position um, based on this hash function H. And the value of it is uniform random between minus one and one using this G function to determine the value. So that's in that sense, you can actually think of feature hashing as a the same construction as the Johnson and Strauss transform, just not a scaling factor in front. Now, if you were to compare, if you remember from the random projections, um, the Johnson and Strauss transform guaranteed that uh, with high probability over this random choice of the matrix, all the pairwise distances between all the, the feature vectors before and after embedding are roughly the same, right? They are within this one plus minus epsilon factor. Now, this is not a guarantee that feature hashing has, right? So it does not promise you that it preserves all the pairwise distances. But on the other hand, feature hashing is very fast, right? You only spend constant time per non-zero on X, right? You basically just hash it and add it to an, a position, right? Johnson Instrauss transform is slower. You could actually still exploit the sparsity, like if the feature vector here is very sparse, uh, each of the non-zeros requires you to take a whole column of the matrix A and add to the output. So it will be proportional to K times the number of non-zeros. So, you know, if you have more time, maybe using a Johnson Instrauss transform would actually be beneficial if you, if you don't worry too much about the speed to compute this embedding. But feature hashing is very, very fast and that's a reason why it's often used. So <clears throat> maybe just let me go back to this bag of words representation with feature hashing. So really, if you think about it, if we, if we have text and we want to, I guess, make a bag of words representation and then I use feature hashing on top of it, we could just do the whole thing in one go mapping directly from strings to uh, the final feature vector, the one that has already had feature hashing applied. And the only thing that we really need in order to do so is hash functions H and G <clears throat> that you can apply to words. Right, so if you have a hash function H that maps a word on n-gram to an, a number between zero and k minus one, and a hash function G that maps uh, a string, a word or an n-gram to a random sign, then you can just use it directly. And what you do is you just scan the word and, or, or the text and for every word or every n-gram, you just directly go into this feature hashed vector, the final output. You hash the word to give you a position in this vector. And then you would, with bag of words representation, you just increment it by one. So here you just take the G uh, and you would have to <clears throat> multiply that with the G function. So basically you, that's exactly what you do. You use the G function to get a, a sign. It's always gonna be the same sign for the same word whenever it occurs. So, so you basically just add that to whatever entry you have in this feature vector. So, so you can kind of do it in one shot instead of going over an intermediate bag of words vector. It's also, I guess, useful to know. You just need a hash function that maps strings and words or n-grams to, to indices and signs, and such hash functions also exist. So, you know, maybe we can just do it with this text up here. <clears throat> you would start by taking the we word, and let's say you have some hash function that can take in a string or a word, and it outputs, say, one as the position, and the sign is minus one. So then you would update position one in the output by minus one. Then you take the shell, Maybe your hash function maps it to zero with a sign of one. So you add one to the first, then execute, you hash it, you get position four perhaps with a sign of one. So you add one to this position and so forth, right? So uh, so this is basically what feature hashing does is if you never have these very sparse vectors, um, for instance, when you're starting with text document, it'll also be used when you don't have text documents. Then what you can do is you can map these feature vectors to much shorter vectors. <clears throat> and these shorter vectors will have just k features rather than d, with k much, much smaller. So in some sense, it's a type of dimensionality reduction that's very fast to compute for sparse input vectors. And now if you have, if you choose k small enough, maybe a couple of hundred, uh, then uh, you can actually plug it directly into <clears throat> neural nets and so on, which you could not do with the previous representation. So that's the benefit here. The thing is to be aware of is that if you choose k too small, uh, then you know uh, very different vectors. It's actually quite likely that they can map to something very similar. You know, so the bigger you choose k, uh, the more precision in some sense you have. And even though I said that uh, feature hashing does not necessarily guarantee that you preserve all the distances between vectors, 
or points to then this one plus minus epsilon packs like random projections that John Lindstrauss transformed does. There's actually some research that uh, on this topic that shows at least if your input vectors are nice enough, it does have this guarantee, but but not for all input vectors. So, you know, so it's, you know, the bigger you choose k, the more precision you get, and so that's worth keeping in mind. But of course, the bigger the k is, the slower the next algorithms get, and the more uh, space you have to use to store the model, for instance, in in a neural net, for instance.